I want to jump on to um, a more compelling one, and this is the one that I always use as an example to challenge this notion about can you prepare for the HPAS? Are there any techniques you can do? So what I want you to do is go on to question eight. Okay, and in actual fact, it's three questions. So you'd have slightly over four minutes to do this. Now, within reason, I think there are, there are maybe 30 or something units. Um, make sure that anybody who didn't use a new unit the last time has one this time. Okay? And what I want you to do is I want you to take no more than four minutes to try and answer all three questions. We'll vote. And then I'm going to see that certain people use a technique that would really help you to, to do this very, very efficiently and very, very effectively. So your four minutes start now. Okay, so that's your four minutes. Now, don't get too downhearted. First of all, I'm going to show you a very useful technique to help you get there an awful lot quicker. And this is also part of the reason why if you can, because you're, you're, you're good at certain questions, shave off 10 or 15 seconds off other questions in contrast uh, to other people, it allows you maybe to spend extra time on something like this where you get a sense that some people are going to struggle with this type of question. So look, within the realms of what you've done, all right, cast your, your votes for question eight. What do you think is the correct answer to it? Please don't dilly-dally now. We want to try and get the three sets of votes out before I show you the technique. Okay. Now, again, some people are probably going to have got there through a reasonable process of elimination, so let's take a look. Sorry, I don't know what happened there. The correct answer is indeed A, which people have got. Okay. Um, you can see that practically nobody picked the distractor, which was C. All right. Um, but again, the correct answer is A, and that was a, a pretty high score, um, but I think that's probably the easier of the, of the three. It also might have been the one you were devoting all your time on. So let's see how you got on in number nine. Okay, that's quite a good uh, set of results for number eight. Okay, so vote for number nine. Correct answer was C, all right, again, but you can see an awful lot of people picked A and B in contrast to it, okay? So again, a difficult enough question, all right? So you can see these ones are trickier, okay? And let's try and cast your votes now for 10. Again, the most popular answer is actually the correct answer, which is D. All right, all the correct answers are in the back. I'll tell you that now, but I don't want you taking a, a cheeky look at them. Uh, okay, that's fair enough, people putting in the correct answer now. Okay, all right, but initially it wasn't too great. Now, you can see there is that still, and this is the thing that Acer would stand over, you see, is that still the correct answer is the most popular answer. But you can see that these were certainly not as easy as the first two we looked at. Okay. So what's the technique that you could use? Well, it's very simple, and I saw some people were doing it, okay, although it was a minority, okay, and the technique to watch out for, okay, is quite simply this. Some people, okay, I can see this lady here did it, for example, all right, and I don't know where you got that insight from, but I can see some people certainly didn't do it. Now, I do this in every seminar, so maybe the word is kind of getting around. When you read the narrative, you should have spotted that there were four sets of data. And what your best way to do this would be to tabularize the data. Okay, and that's what some people tried to do. So that's why, again, the question that your colleague asked here about your ability to work within the actual exam booklet, you have to, yes, squeeze all that in there. And that's something you have to watch out for. So this is everything that was explicitly given to us. Okay, now if anybody wants a copy of this presentation, all you have to do is email me. I'll send it on to you. We were given this all explicitly. And the way I would approach this is do it like a computer program. So go from left to right, top to bottom, until you get to the bottom, and then repeat the routine again until you're able to populate it completely. If you take a look at it here, I'm going to go through it quite quickly. What's in black was given to us explicitly. Everything else we have been able to put in as a, as a result of deduction. And the more we're able to actually fill in, the more we're able to fill in in turn. In fact, in time, you're able to completely reconcile the entire table. All right? But well, let's just get down as far as the bottom one just to show you. So we know that chemistry is not at 8 a.m. because whatever's been taught in room 5.1 is at 8 a.m. So, you know, chemistry is in 3.1, chemistry is not at 8 a.m. The next thing we know is that obviously chemistry isn't taught in 5.1 because it's taught in 3.1. We keep going. 
We know that French is not taught in 3.1 because we know chemistry is taught in 3.1. Um, we know that Anne doesn't do chemistry because we're told Anne does French. Okay, and the way I'm doing it is going left to right and going down like this. That's just the way I'm doing it. Now, if you're very, very quick with it and you can move around it in an a la carte fashion with no kind of structure, that's fine for you. But I think this is a good logical process uh, way of doing it. Okay, then we look at the fact that Lisa um, doesn't do French, okay, because Anne does French. Um, then we know that Lisa uh, isn't doing the class at 8 a.m. because Lisa does her class at 1 p.m. Um, then we know, I'm um, sorry, which one did I just have to do there? Um, we know that um, ma maths is not done by Anne because of the time that it's done at. We know that David doesn't do French because we know Anne does French. We know David doesn't do maths. All right, why do we know that? Because maths um, is done by Lisa, uh, sorry, uh, maths is um, not in 2.3 and David does his class in 2.3. We know David doesn't do chemistry because chemistry is in B3.1 and David does his class in 2.3. Now we have our first thing we can say for sure. David does English. So you see the way we've gone through it there, the one that's in green, all right, by basically putting in what we were given and then concluding what you could conclude from what we were given, we were able to establish that David does English. Now, we're able to keep going on David. We're also able to discuss that David doesn't do his subject at 8 a.m., because we know that the class in 5.1 is at 8 a.m. We know that David doesn't do his topic or his subject at 1 p.m. because Lisa does her subject at 1 p.m. We know that David doesn't do it at, at 10 a.m. because what's done in 10 a.m. is not done in room 2.3 and that's where David goes to class. Therefore, we know that it's at 12 p.m. Do we get the idea? So now we know that David does English in a class yet to be, or which we were given explicitly at 12 p.m. And what you basically do now is you start and you go through the whole process again. And as you go through it, you should, within the four minutes you have, or you might give it an extra minute because you feel that this is one that's going to catch people out. Maybe you've shaved off some time on other questions, so you actually have a minute to give it. And if you go through it, you, you, you're eventually going to have to say, look, at stop. You mightn't have it fully reconciled, but you might have so much reconciled that you're able to accurately answer a large number of the questions. Do we get the idea? Now, Here's the thing that I get asked. Is anybody telling me, so on the basis of that, that a student who would attempt that question without some technique would do as well as a student that would use that technique? I think there's a simple answer to that. Okay, so again, this whole myth that you know you can't prepare for the H pat and you can't practice for the H pat, it is what it is. It's a myth. Because that's a typical question that would happen in these types of tests, and you can see there that it is a very, very quick way or a quick or way of you being able to reconcile all of the sets of data or at least up to a stage where you could confidently answer a large number of the questions okay it might be an interesting one for you to try yourself at home you know with a stopwatch to see how long does it actually take you to work out the entire table you know your target is four minutes you know how close to that four minutes could you get it done or what could you get done within four minutes is that okay all right so that's always one that i kind of use to try and demonstrate this particular uh, part. Is everybody happy enough with that? Okay. All right, um, so we've 12 minutes left. I want to do, um, I'm just gonna do maybe one question in section two, and then I'm gonna go on my, my favorite section um, in a minute. I'm just gonna show you one simple technique uh, for section uh, two. Can you go to question seven in section two? I think you should be comfortable in this now. There shouldn't be a problem. This is the section where you have the least amount of time Remember, you have only 75 seconds per question in section two. That's one minute and 15 seconds. So you have to make your, your decision quite quickly, okay? So section two, question seven, off you go. Okay, now you should score reasonably well on this one. Um, but again, this is a, a section where people probably should be scoring an awful lot better if they, if they um, uh, dedicated a bit of thought to it. Okay. So, without doubt, the most popular um, answer. Now, again, we have to try and look at, and this is one of the ones that's like, why is the correct answer enraged and not offended? Okay? Um, sometimes you actually expect, and it's an interesting one here, it just shows you about the different way that people view things. Sometimes can happen in courses that the second most popular answer for this is actually incensed, and that some people actually think that the action there is incensed. Now, a very useful technique here when dealing with emotions uh, you'll see on the back of the presentation, I have basically five techniques that I use for each, each uh, session. And one of the very important ones about emotions, the technique I basically recommend 
is that you end up with a continuum. Okay? So you basically have, you have an extreme over here, and then you have another extreme here. And what you try and do is you get those emotions and you put them into some logical order. Now sometimes, by the way, you'll get a question where one of the emotions is a distractor. It's got nothing to do with the other range of emotions that are being described. So if you look at it here, you might put them into the following kind of order. Um, offended would be the least extreme. So you might have offended here. Now you probably can do this in your head. You wouldn't necessarily need to do this in rough work. And just because an awful lot of you got this particular one right, doesn't necessarily mean, you know, still 11 people didn't get it right. You know, so there is room to improve for some certain people. So you might say, look at offended of the four that are there is the least extreme. It's the mildest um, actual reaction. And then we might talk about the fact um, that we have, right, um, incensed. And you should be careful about incensed because incensed is more about being indignant about something. All right? But people think I was incensed about Incensed is kind of like huffing and puffing. You know, how, you know what was the character that, um, what's her name, Catherine Tate does? You know the character, how very dare you? You know, that kind of idea. That's somebody who's incensed, all right? Then we talk about angered, okay? And then we probably talk, okay, about enraged. And again, why would you suggest that, you know, this behavior that's been demonstrated here is at the other extreme of the scale? Why is this person, Shane, <laughs> behaving in an enraged way? All right? Because he's talking in very, very graphic and violent ways, okay? I'd have torn her head off with my bare hands, okay? That's not somebody who's offended, incensed, or even angered, okay? That's somebody who's enraged. They're in a rage. They're not thinking rationally. You know, you're not actually going to do that. It's an emotional response. Do we get the idea? So that's a handy one to use when you get these types of questions where it's dealing with emotions. How did somebody feel? So basically try and get them into some sort of a system where you basically say, where would they appear in kind of a scale or put them in some sort of a barometer? Often there'll be one will be a distractor, so you'll dismiss that straight away. It's not in that range of emotions, okay? It's something else, all right? Confused, for example. If confused was in that, you'd say, that's got nothing to do with somebody responding in an aggressive way to something. So you'd ignore it for starters. And then you'd look at the other ones and say, which one of those remaining ones does the behavior here match? The other thing that maybe is a useful thing for this, and it's not a rough work thing, is visualize. What would somebody's face look like who's offended, incensed, angered, or enraged? And you can kind of think enrage is the one where there's kind of smoke coming out their ears and they're going all red, etc. So that's a very, very useful one. Now, this is again what section two tests, because in life, as you become more experienced and you become more emotionally intelligent, you'll know it when you see it. You'll be able to know when somebody you're dealing with, let's say a patient in a couple of years, is actually incensed, angered, or enraged. You know, you won't need to kind of think about it at all. But what they're trying to test here, I suppose, is do you have some sort of a competency in that already? All right, are you, are you kind of, uh, you know, heading in the right direction? Okay, um, can we go on to the, um, uh, the, the non-verbal reasoning? These are my favorite ones now, but we've only a couple of minutes left, so I always do them last because I could do these all day. I really like these. Okay, now let's take a look at the first three here. I'm not going to get you to vote on these. I'm going to get you to vote on other ones. Um, these are ones that were available on the ACER website, very straightforward. This first one here is, um, is part of the group that people dislike the most. Uh, in section three, although they don't state this, typically what happens is there are three sets of ten questions each. Uh, three of, or ten of the questions will be complete the sequence. So you're given four shapes and then you're given a blank and you have to pick one of five shapes to complete it. The next one is complete the grid. Okay, so you'll be given maybe a three by three square or you might be given, you know, a hexagon that's divided into parts and one of them will be missing and you have to pick which one is missing. And then you have these ones, which are the ones that people typically don't like. So you're given five shapes in an order and you're told rearrange them into a logical order, right, so that you can identify the shape that should be in the middle. So in other words, that that order there is not correct. There's a more logical way of ordering these shapes in that regard. Now, there are five techniques that I use with this as well. The one I'm specializing on or concentrating on here with you is shapes as numbers. And this is very, a very simple number sequence, okay? What you basically have is two of the shapes are repeated. So you know, right, a little bit like a dance step, 
that this is a 1, 2, 3, 4 sequence. 1, 2, 3, 4, 1, 2, 3, 4, 1, 2, 3, 4, 1, 2, 3, 4. So you know what actually has been pr presented to you here is five shapes, but it's actually 1, 2, 3, 4, 1. Therefore, you know that shapes A and D are the two bookmarks, essentially. 1, 2, 3, 4, and 1. And then what you have to try and do is figure out how does A progress such that it starts again when it's at D in position 5. So in other words, how does A go through four iterations to basically turn out to be A again? And in this one, it's very, very simple because it's 1, 2, 3, 4. We can see that the black basically moves down. So in actual fact, the way that the shapes would be drawn would be, this is 1, okay, push it down 1 to 2, push it down 1 to 3, push it down 1 to 4, and then push it down around, goes back up, okay, to 5. So therefore, we know that the middle shape is E, exactly. Okay, is everybody happy with that? So it shapes as numbers, very, very straightforward. Now, I think maybe they're being a little bit disingenuous. Like I said, that was on the Acer website. That actually would be on kind of the easier uh, side of things in contrast to some of the actual uh, rearrange the sequence questions you get. Having said that, an awful lot of the techniques are exactly the same. Okay? All right, so that's that particular one. Uh, looking down at number two, terribly easy one. This is another one of the techniques called building and replacement. So what you basically have here, and you can all see it very straightforward, you have this particular line here, okay? It's moving in an anti-clockwise way, one position each time, okay? Therefore, we know the next time it's going to be like that, all right? We can also see that any time that the, anti or the line crosses two squares, it rubs them out, okay? So in this particular one, of course, what we're looking for is one in which the line is going diagonally, which is these two, okay? But which one of them actually is it? Is it D or is it E? Which one of them actually is it? D, yes, because we can see that what actually has happened here, okay, and this one is the two lines are over each other. So that middle line never moves, okay? And again, what there'll often be is there'll be two of the answers that look like they're right. You know that the line has to go like this. You know that it has to cross out the two boxes, but then you have to say, what about the other line? This line here stays constant. That line stays constant each time, therefore the correct answer is D. And that's a simple one called building and replacement. Now. The more difficult questions are hybrids, where it'll be building and replacement plus shapes and numbers, or it'll be clockwise and symmetry, okay? You know, these are the ideas behind them. Okay, next one is very, very straightforward. This is obviously clockwise and symmetry, okay? Uh, for argument's sake, we're going to call them two dogs, and we're not going to get into a big debate about one is a dog and the other is an Irish wolfhound or whatever it is, okay? There are two, two dogs, one sitting on its hind legs, one standing on all fours, okay? Now, it's a very simple one, and again, I think these are a little bit too simple. I'm going to try and go do more difficult ones with you now in a second. We can see that this is constant, okay? So the inside of the shape, the dog sitting on its hind legs, its head is always facing in towards the center, okay? So we know that basically the head is going to be facing here, and the hind legs are going to be sitting there, and we know which way the nose is going to be facing. So on that basis, we can narrow it down to either D or B, okay? We know it must be one of those two. But what's happening with the other dog? Yes, it's kind of pivoting, okay? It's pivoting in a symmetrical way. So the correct answer is B, correct. Okay, everybody happy with that? All right, now I want you to have a go, okay? I'd like you to have a go with them in two short bursts. I know I'm going a little bit over in time. If you have to leave now uh, to catch a lift or transport or whatever you need, uh, please do. Uh, but I'm just going to go through these, uh, these couple if you wished me to go through them. So try number four, try number five, and try number six together, okay? And you have four minutes to do the three of them. So four, five, and six. Should be a reasonably easy one because, again, you look at it and you say, look at it, can't be anything to do with clockwise movement. It's nothing to do with building and replacement. It's nothing to do with symmetry. Therefore, it has to be shapes as numbers. Okay, so again, we'll see if people got it correct. Correct answer was C. Okay, yes, the most popular answer, but the least popular today. Okay, another person voting afterwards. That's very good. All right. And another one. All right. 
This is fantastic. All right. Okay. Um, now, the whole idea about this is, you know, and a huge part in Section 3, and that's why it's no surprise in the interim report that was done in the HPAT, the people who repeated the HPAT improved their score the most and very significantly in Section 3 because it is an acquired skill. It is something that you need to improve on. So the whole idea here is that basically it shapes as numbers. Uh, you have seven lines in the first shape, you have 11 in the next shape, uh, you have 15 in the next shape, you keep going, you have 19, and then of course you're going to have your 23. Uh, Therefore the correct answer is C. Okay, so a circle is one line for example, and again that's the idea behind it. So fairly straightforward. So again, one of the first things is to basically say what techniques do not apply here. Nothing to do with symmetry, nothing to do with clockwise, uh, nothing to do with building and replacement, therefore it can only be one, shapes as numbers. So cast your votes on number five. Now I'd be expecting there to be problems with this one because an awful lot of you probably worked it out and said there's actually no shape like the shape that I'd expect to be next. All right, now maybe I'm not giving you enough, um, enough credit. So we'll take a look at it. All right, so let's take a look. No, you didn't fall into the trap, okay? So that's actually quite good, it just shows you. And this is again why we, we strongly believe that Acer actually designed the marking scheme after the cohort have done it, because who's to say? I would have actually thought that you wouldn't have performed as well in that question as the previous one. And that's why we believe that an awful lot of these tests, and they're very fair if they do it that way, is they don't actually have a preordained marking scheme. You decide, which is a hard and an easy question. All right? Okay, so that's quite good, all right? And then let's try the next one, okay, number six. Okay, number six should be quite a doable one now, in fairness. And this one I did to try and catch you out because it's not shapes as numbers. A lot of people here think that there's a sequence of one, three, six, therefore nine. Uh, one, three, six, nine is not a sequence. You know, it's not a correct sequence anyway. Okay, so an awful lot of people have fallen into that trap. And again, you think about it very, very carefully. Okay, so let's see if we can get how many people got the right answer. The right answer, of course, if I can just get the mouse to work now, is D. All right, and everybody got that. Okay, so fairly straightforward. Okay. All right, there's one last one I'd like you to try and uh, consider before you go. All right, we won't get you to vote on these now because I am going very, very considerably over the time. What's the, the approach uh, for number seven? It is shapes as numbers, obviously. Okay, so let me just... We'll get one of your colleagues here now to share their view. Now, which is the right answer, by the way? No. Anybody else want to pick the right answer? Maybe I should have got you to vote on this one. No. E. Did somebody say E? Okay, and how did you arrive at that? Well, let's talk about the Y for starters, okay? What we have is, in terms of the first letter, sorry, pardon me now, what we have is, between this and this and this and this, there obviously is a distance of two. Do we agree? Okay. So Y, okay, going backwards, W, X, Y, all right, Q, R, S, T, U, V, W, okay, S, T, U. So we know that the actual next letter is Q. Okay, so straight away, it's not that one. So we're down to a, an option of, of uh, four. Okay. The next thing then we look is, is, is the middle pattern. So again, it shapes as numbers. So from E to F is a space of one. Do we agree on that? From F to H, so F, G, H is a space of two. Right, from H to K, all right, H, I, J, K is a space of three. Therefore, the next one should be a space of four. Do we agree on that? So K, L, M, N, O. Do we agree? So it has to then be O. So then there, this one is gone and this one is gone. Do we get the idea? So the first letter, it's a space of minus two. The next letter, it's plus one, plus two, plus three, plus four. Everybody with me so far? Okay, now, the next one is tricky. So B, all right, so B, C, D, that's a space of two. Do we get that? From B to D, B, C, D. From D to G, all right, E, F, G, a space of three. Everybody happy? And then from G to I, okay, H, I, a space of two. So this is where it was tricky, plus two, plus three, plus two, therefore, plus three. Do we get the idea? Okay, and therefore it can only be QOL. Are we happy with that? Now, 
I probably should have got you to vote on that one on hindsight. I know for the next seminar I will because you weren't as maybe confident with that or maybe you didn't get a chance to do it. But that's an example of one that I would call busy. That's a busy one. So if you can get other ones done quickly, all right, it allows you to allocate a little bit more time to those because it's not going to just jump up off the page. You have to try and figure out what the pattern is. And again, you had a situation there where there was a consistent pattern, there was an increasing pattern, and then there was what you'd call maybe an irregular pattern. Plus two, plus three, plus two, plus three. So you had a lot going on. But again, straight away your first thing is, what techniques are not applicable? And you get stuck into it. Okay? Anyway, I'm biased. It's my favorite section. All right. Okay, that's it. Thanks very much for your attention. <laughs>